further wait. Um, we'll begin with uh, our next speaker. Um, Dr. James Lee comes from Ohio State. He's a professor in chemical engineering. And his talk is titled Design Fabrication and Application of Polymer Micro Nanofluidic Biochips. So, uh, Dr. Thank you. First, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to uh, host a uh, conference or workshop. Uh, it's the first time I come to this uh, university in Illinois. As mentioned, I, uh, I'm at Ohio State University, so it's about a, uh, uh, less than six hours driving distance from, uh, from here. So if you have a chance to visit uh, Ohio, uh, 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 Princeton, you know, I'd be glad to uh, show you how rapid they are. Uh, so basically, uh, the talk I'm going to present to you today is a part of the research effort uh, from the NSF Nanoscale Science and Engineering Center. And we, uh, we have one at Ohio State University, and there's also one at University of uh, Illinois uh, here. Uh, I, uh, I, myself, I uh, got my bachelor's degree from uh, National Taiwan University a uh, long time ago. I understand this is quite a lot of people here also from Taiwan. So, uh, uh, welcome here for the long trip. <coughs> so um, uh, the title of my talk is Design Fabrication and Applications of uh, Polymer uh, Micro Nanofluidic uh, Biochips. So first, uh, uh, let me uh, briefly explain for why we focus on the polymer materials. We all know that for the micro nano uh, technology, really the, the semiconductors uh, are the major materials. And the polymer has uh, been used in industry for a long, long time. But in the micro nano scale, polymer is still relatively new. However, when you try to combine the micro nano technology with biotechnology, uh, we believe the polymer <coughs> has several advantages. First, is it has a usually uh, uh, better biocompatibility, and it's less uh, toxical, and some of the polymer is biodegradable. So, therefore, if you try to develop the devices used for in vivo, uh, the polymer based materials uh, has an advantage compared with other materials. And also, polymer in general is low cost compared to the uh, semiconductor or other materials. So, if you make the biochips, uh, there is important consideration because usually the biochips uh, need to be disposable, uh, not like computer chips. We'll put a computer chip in the laptop, like I'm using my laptop today. I'm not going to throw my laptop away after this talk. I'm going to keep it. But on the other hand, for the biochips, usually you don't want to uh, test using the same chip again for the same patient sample there because of potential uh, contamination. Therefore, the chip has to be disposable. And therefore, the cost has to be low in order to make it a reasonable unfold. Uh, the third one is that the uh, polymer and the biomolecule essentially have the same chemical structure. A biomolecule polymer is essentially a biomaterial is essentially a polymer. So therefore, it's easier to add on the different type of functionality, uh, chemical, physical, and biological functionality. So therefore, those are the advantages of polymer materials. But uh, I do have to point out, uh, polymer materials also have limitation compared to the semiconductors. Because semiconductors, very well established technology, and easy to connect with controller, uh, with any uh, sensors. And so therefore, most of the devices will often have to combine the polymer materials with other materials in order to achieve the best results. Um, for the biosensor biochips, I'm pretty sure you've heard uh, quite a lot of uh, talks like this uh, workshop and you're going to hear more. Uh, here I just show the several examples here, like a DNA gene chips, PCR chips, and the SS, uh, etc. Uh, some of the chips they, uh, probably need a micro scale type of design and functions. But other than chips, uh, quite often we need to get it to the nanoscale. And today I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, in the micro scale, I'm going to show you an immunoassay. And the, uh, for the nano one, biochip is a, for a special type of uh, drug and gene delivery, in particular the gene delivery system. But anyway, uh, no matter what type of biochips or biosensors, uh, usually we need to combine the micro nano technology and also proper biological functions, how to integrate them together. Uh, is a way to make this uh, area unique. Uh, but uh, if you look at the micro nanotechnology for the micro nano fluid chips, uh, first of course we need to design proper type of uh, micro nano fluid functions 
for example, how did you pump the, 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 the samples from one location to the other? How do you put it back on the very small biochips? And how do you do the mixing? How do you do the separation? At a very, very small size. Uh, second one is fabrication. Okay, for the polymer materials, uh, usually there are two steps. First is you need to make a, a master for making mold. Then using this master to replicate, hopefully at a low, uh, high speed, low cost, high precision, to make a large number of chips, which can be used for many people. Uh, packaging is important. Uh, for the bio uh, chips, the packaging definition is a little different. Uh, usually this included the uh, surface modification, which I will give you one example. Uh, how did you find the uh, pieces together? In particular, when you have uh, bio molecules on the bio chips, proteins, DNAs, even the living cells. Uh, when you have those bio molecules there, the pumping is not uh, heat. You cannot use high temperature. Uh, you cannot use very toxic or organic solvent. You know, those are the other material people you should use to bump pieces together. But uh, you just cannot do it with bio molecules. Uh, everything has to be below body temperature, uh, which is really against the kind of bonding processing we are used to uh, in traditional industry or even semiconductor industry. So how did you de de design and carry out what we call biological design of bonding and processing techniques where there's a bio molecule there? Otherwise, you have to make the chip first, then you try to load the bio molecule, which is not as good. Okay, so packaging is not necessarily an easy task. Uh, of course, eventually you have to integrate with control circuit, sensors, detectors, and those are usually not the not the polymer material. You have to rely on the uh, semiconductor and other uh, materials, other techniques. Yeah, so uh, the two uh, examples I'm going to share with you today is going to cover some of those basic uh, functions here. Uh, well, uh, this slide basically shows that, uh, just in case you are not familiar with the polymer-based micro nanotechnology, uh, this slide kind of uh, summarizes the, uh, the current trend. Uh, for the micro uh, fabrication or micro processing, uh, the technology is pretty well developed. Uh, you can people can use it for production today. Uh, not so fancy. If you look at a, a master, how to make a mold, when they choose a uh, mold combination mm -hmm. tool making technology, so called the CNC machining, the ones you see in the typical machine shop, except you try to make it smaller. Uh, the the uh, EDM type of technology or even a laser. So those are non cleaning technology. One can also choose the cleaning technology, which you, most of you are very familiar with, photoresography, uh, radical ion etching, including the big radical ion etching, and sometimes including the electroplate breaking. Uh, this is to make the mold, to make the master. Then one can choose different methods to replicate the biochips. Uh, you can do the casting, you can do micro-injection molding, micro-embossing, or so on so on. So those are pretty well established. But on the other hand, at the nano scale, uh, first is more expensive, <coughs> second is not as well <coughs> established. For example, when you choose the X-ray, uh, uh, X-ray sonography, so called EGA, or the electro green sonography, in order to make the dimension very, very small, and we all know those are not a really low cost equipment. Uh, there are several uh, low cost uh, methods which I will share with you while to special methods, uh, which is actually pretty simple. Uh, then the replication method, including the so called the top down, uh, you all heard that nano imprinting, or sometimes the bottom up, uh, using the chemical synthesis actually to put the molecules together, so called the cell assembly. <coughs> and quite often you need to use both the top down and the bottom up combined together. So those are the current status of the polymer based micro nano uh, fabrication. Okay, so the, in the remaining time, I'm going to uh, share with you two examples. The first example is a uh, call based on the micro scale polymer processing. And this one, and also combined the micro fluid design. And the chip is called CD ELISA. Okay, so let me first give you an introduction. Uh, ELISA stands for uh, enzyme linked uh, immunosolvent acid ELISA. Uh, it's one of the most widely used in uh, medical diagnosis too. I'm pretty sure many of you in the room probably using ELISA in your research or in your job. Uh, in the United States, uh, the market size is about a billion dollars per year. Uh, this kind of uh, asset can be used for uh, 
for life science research, can be used for uh, food uh, pathogen detection, can be used for detect like cancers or many different immune diseases, and even the environmental uh, uh, pollutions like the water contamination. Uh, people even think this thing can be used for the national security, like to detect the uh, uh, biochemical warfare type of uh, uh, agents. Uh, just in case you are not familiar with the ELISA process, uh, let me walk you through the typical uh, ELISA. Uh, in this example here, basically that's a direct sample. Uh, you want to detect whether there's a special antigen in the sample, and this antigen shown in, in this sample here. You want to detect whether there's energy in the sample, how much it is uh, in there. So what one should do first is to select the proper antibody with this symbol. Uh, this antibody recognizes uh, energy and okay, provide a high selectivity. So what you do is you first you have to bond the first antibody on the detection uh, detector surface. So you put there and you need a certain time for the incubation, then you wash it. And some of the antibody will bond on the surface. That's first step. Okay, then however, there are other surfaces not covered by the antibody. Therefore, you need to cover the surface to, to then the non specific binding for the later materials you apply. And usually, people are using a low cost like protein, like a, uh, a BSA, as shown on this symbol. So, you need to apply the so called blocking protein uh, to the surface. Again, you need incubation, then you wash it. Okay? Then the third step is to put a sample. You put a sample in there. If the sample contains the specific antigen, they will bind. Otherwise, they won't. But however, we really want to detect a very, very small amount of sample. So therefore, you need a high sensitivity. And usually what people do is to add the second uh, antibody called conjugate using this sample. Uh, this antibody, again, only recognizes this antigen. So therefore, they will form this kind of a sandwich structure. People also call this as a sandwich amino acid. And the difference of this second antibody versus the first antibody is that there's an uh, enzyme here, the blue star. But this enzyme, one enzyme can interact with many, many uh, molecules. And this molecule is called substrate. Okay? And the, the reaction will, will create the radiation. So therefore, the signal can be detected by UV or by fluorescence. So therefore, you can use UV detector or fluorescent detector to detect the signal. And this gives you the high sensitivity. So therefore, high sensitivity, high sensitivity is a unique uh, feature of these protein chips. But however, it requires many steps. Uh, the conventional way is using so-called the micro uh, title plate, such as this 96 well, right? This piece of plastic uh, with many, many uh, tiny holes there. Each hole is about a uh, a sort of micro, uh, 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 micro uh, millimeter size. Now what you do is using a pipette. So you load the uh, reagent into the wells, uh, then you wait for a while, you wash it, you load the second uh, reagent, you wait, and you wash it, and just do it uh, step by step. Of course, some of you might say, can we use a robot? Answer is yes. For the large uh, pharmaceutical company or the large hospital, for example, of people that made the drug. Every technical drug has to go through the ELISA, make sure there's no HIV or some kind of disease in the drug donation. And those are huge uh, with a number of bags, and they don't use a human hand. They use a robot. And that robot can do this by itself. Except those robots are close to $1 million a piece. So therefore, at least in my life, I cannot afford it. So my students still use it. <laughs> Sorry to say that in the university we still hear it out. Okay. So anyway, uh, what can see that is a uh, pretty time consuming. Uh, some of the essay takes several days. Uh, most of it takes like uh, ten hours, twelve hours. Some of the shorter ones like HIV detection, uh, four to five hours. Uh, so it's uh, time consuming. And also, when you start the first step, you have to finish the whole thing. You cannot stop. It. And also, you really have to control the time. If you miss for a few minutes, sorry, your data is wrong. You have to start again. So therefore, my students don't like me. They said, that please, can we just do one? I said, no, we have to do some. So uh, really, it's not a very, very uh, uh, friend, friendly technique. Uh, that's why I mentioned here, unless you use robot, it's a pretty uh, uh, labor-intensive process. A relatively large amount of the reagent, 
for the 96 web, uh, uh, typically you need a several hundred micro And uh, this chip is not a very low cost. Uh, typically you buy a, a total kit, uh, they give you a plate, which is 96 web across all the reagents, costs you about $500. So therefore every single web is about $5. US dollars. Is that cheap? I mean, it depends. Okay? So therefore, you think about it, if you can shrink the size to 100 times, instead of $5, only $0.05 cents is much better. Right? So that's what we uh, try to do, is that can we use a micro nanotechnology to make things better. Okay? So anyway, so this is the one idea, it's using a CD as a platform. By the way, we are not the first one using CD. There's are many pirate ships using CD. We are probably the first one using CD in ISA. Okay, the idea is very simple. You use a uh, Frank CD. We all know it's very, very well cost, several cents a piece, Frank CD. Uh, you design and you fabricate the micro channels or reservoir on the surface of the CD. And you can preload the different type of reagents you need uh, under the CD. And uh, when it's ready to use, the user can put a sample usually near the center of the CD and basically rely on the rotation. Very simple. You know, rotation gives you the centrifugal force, and that's your pump. Okay? And that will drive the samples and the reagent to the detection area one by one. Remember, the United States here to do it one by one. Okay? So we run the rotation to do that. And if this CD is small enough, you can use a handhold device. And this provides so-called point of care. Point of care means you don't have to go to the hospital. You can do it at home. The so called point of care, a very fast response because we are talking about very small amount of reaging and small amount of reaging here. Parallel detection, you can put many uh, similar uh, design on a single CD. So you don't do one, you do a series of detection simultaneously. Uh, information can be stored in the computer, can be transferred to other locations through the internet. All the biochips that uh, want to do this, not just CD ELISA. Okay, but CD ELISA is all the same. So that's basic um, concept. So therefore, we have the detector here, try to detect the signal here. Uh, let me show you this, for example, is one of our early design. Uh, basically, if you come there, there are 24 sets of the device on the single CPU surface. Uh, here shows one set of uh, 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 device. Uh, you can see there are many uh, micro wells, so you can put a different region at a different location. And then, what you try to do is to control it. So you want to bring those reagents to the detection area, in this case, it is wrong line here. You try to bring here one by one in order to carry out the ELISA. The question is how do you do it? Don't use a human hand, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's what I'm going to show you, okay? uh, The idea I already mentioned to you, you need a pump, you need a valve, in this case. Pump, uh, rotation. Uh, that's a very simple common concept. Uh, you don't need any uh, high-tech stuff, uh, some trigger poles. Which means, if you put your uh, chamber or reservoir far away from the center of the CD, at the same rotation speed, the force will be higher. If you put your chamber close to the center of the CD, the force will be lower at the same rotation speed. And also at the same location, if you increase the rotation, the force is higher. It's very simple, okay? So that's the idea. But however, how, uh, how did you stop the flow? Uh, the, there are different ways to do the, the valve. The, the simplest one uh, for the microchip is probably the capillary valve. We run the capillary force. Uh, simply to say, when you have a solution going through the micro channel, and to the end of the channel, the liquid actually can stop because of the formation of the meniscus, uh, the so-called capillary uh, force there. And this capillary force depends on the gamma here at the surface tension. Uh, always biofluid, the water-based solution. So there's a certain surface tension, contact angle theta, which is very important. And the D here is the dimension of this microchannel we can design. The R here is the location of this chamber. So basically, if your centrifugal force is lower than your capillary force, the liquid will not flow through. It will stop it. However, if your centrifugal force is higher, it will go through. So the balance of the two is this S sub B. We call it plus the frequency, which means you need to rotate at this speed in order to let the liquid in this chamber to go through to overcome this force. And so this is a simple equation you can use to do the calculation, to do the design. Uh, the, uh, this slide further expands the capital force, as mentioned to you, when the fluids come out from the microchannel, it may stop, 
uh, the amount of force to stop this flow, so-called back, is the, uh, this one, delta PS, which is controlled by the surface tension, uh, which is the solution you use. Uh, D is the dimension of the microchannel, and the theta is the contact angle, which is dependent on the variability between the solid surface and the solution you use. So what we, what we do is we try to choose a hydrophobic material, because we want to keep the theta as high as possible. You can see that if theta equals zero, sine zero equals zero, theta P is zero. We don't have that. The liquid just goes through. So therefore, one chooses a very hydrophobic uh, surface. Polymer, unfortunately, most of the polymers are petroleum chemical, they are hydrophobic. So therefore, you can choose many polymer. Now here, let me show you one uh, example. Uh, by uh, con control the D, the dimen dimension D, you can also control the, the direction of the lab. Here, for example, we put the a liquid in this uh, reservoir in the middle. Let me turn on. And then you can see that the capillary valve will stop the flow here and here. It won't, it won't go. If we use a pen to touch it, and you can see that it will go to the right, but it will not go to the left. It's because this D is smaller than this D. So therefore, delta P here is higher than delta P there. So one can use a very simple idea to control the flow direction if you want to. Okay? So that's one uh, uh, example. Here I show you the, the CD. You can see we know the different locations of the solutions. And then we try to uh, rotate a different RPM, 850 RPM. You watch it, one solution down. The other two states, those states. Then you go to high RPM. Now you can see that, you see, another set of first down. They all come to the edge. Finally, you go to the 1800 RPM. All done. Okay, so there, therefore you can, uh, using this kind of rotation to control the so-called flow sequence question. Yes, I, I was wondering how you uh, manipulate the chamber on the surface of the CD. Is it like nanofabrication? Uh, this is actually fabrication. Yeah, those are in the micro scale. Okay, uh, I will also show you that actually we need to do some surface fabrication. Uh, this is the easy one because we use the full dye. In the water, there's no pro protein, there's no DNA, so it works beautiful. Uh, but I will show you some, uh, some uh, uh, challenges down the road. Uh, this one showed, uh, uh, we try to focus on the local uh, area. I hope this thing works. I don't know. I don't know if this movie works or not. It doesn't look like it works. Uh, you know, there's supposed to be uh, uh, the liquid in this uh, reservoir. Uh, let me see whether it works here. Oh, okay, it works now. Just slow. So you can see you put it, uh, again, the solution at five reservoir. At a low RPM, the, this liquid flows the other four states. Okay, and this is waste reservoir. And now you increase the RPM. This one will synchronize the camera so we can see what's going on. Second one flows, the other three states. So you can do this one by one. Okay, you go to the omega three which is higher RPM, omega-3. Now this one goes the other two states. So you can do this one by one. And uh, the, uh, the straight line here is this simple equation. Uh, the, the red and the green dots are the two repeated experiments. So the equation is not perfect, but it's not too bad. Okay, we can select the so-called bus uh, frequency. Uh, the bottom one here is show you the, the detection area. Uh, in this case, we have this diamond shape of detection area. You can see uh, the, dilute, the, the light color solution come, then replaced by the dark color. And when the next one come in, it will replace it and push them into the waste bed. So you do this one by one, uh, by, by, by computer, not by hand. Okay. So, uh, so this uh, uh, provides the uh, so-called flow uh, sequence, flow sequence. However, uh, let's say a very good question there is that we really, really have to be sure all those parameters remain constant. Because you can see that this uh, rotation speed is controlled by those parameters. If one of these parameters change, and your design is going to run. Okay, then the surface tension is not going to change because that's your solution. Uh, R and D will, won't change. You make a CD or you design the R and D. So the ones will change is the theta. Theta is the contact angle between the polymer and the solution. And as I mentioned to you, one needs to choose very hydrophobic surface. But 
in the sample, there's a biomolecule, proteins, DNA, what happened? They were then bound onto the surface. When they're bound onto the surface, they become hydrophilic. Biomolecule is water soluble. Okay, and also remember we use a BSA to block the surface, so-called blocking protein. That protein also makes the surface hydrophilic. So therefore, if you think about it, if this thing began hydrophilic, say that keep changing, and your design is going to go wrong. So therefore, what I show you now is just water. Water works beautiful. But when we put a biofluid, unfortunately, it doesn't work very well. Here, this is the one without the further surface treatment. You can see that this is totally back. It doesn't, it doesn't do a good job. The liquid goes this way, goes this way. Because we use the PSA to block the surface. However, we can solve this problem by using so-called the super hydrophobic surface. It's on the right-hand side. You see, you know, in the back area, we, make a, we put some materials in there. Now it works. What happened? Well, this is a surface modification to make a super hydrophobic. I'm going to use the next slide to explain to you. Uh, basically, we put a, a polymer called polyaniline. It's a conductive uh, uh, polymer. Uh, if you carry out the formation from aniline to polyaniline at low temperature, you can form this kind of nanostructure. This is nanoscale. And my student called them as a nanograss. Uh, it's almost like a cow copy, a copy. But anyway, you can also you can make this, or you can put some microstructure. You grow the nanostructure. And this surface becomes a super hydrophobic, like many uh, locus. Many of you know the uh, locus effect. Here, for example, the water, the, the contact angle is very, very high, 175 degrees. It's almost like solid. The water won't, won't, won't even touch it. As a matter of fact, I show you, show this movie here. If it works, you can see that when we put the water on top, it will just bounce away. Because the surface is so super hydrophobic. Okay. And so uh, uh, this is why it works. But here, let me show you. If we use just a uh, poly, PMMA, uh, acrylic, the contact angle is not very high. And if you put a pro protein on the surface, contact angle becomes very, very low. It doesn't work. Even you put a uh, Teflon, uh, by the way, this is a CYTOP cycle, is a Teflon solution from Japan, company Japan, is a solution of uh, Teflon. Uh, if you put this, Teflon on the polymer surface, contact angle becomes a little higher, not much. Again, the pro protein binding is going to reduce the contact angle. But see what happens when we have this nanostructure. Okay, if you use the cytopolyanoline, it becomes 170. Even with the protein binding, it's still super hydrophobic. By the way, the super hydrophobic, the contact angle needs to be higher than 150 degrees. That's the definition of super hydrophobic. So one can see that with a proper surface modification, we can solve uh, this uh, problem. Okay, another uh, issue we do have to worry in the microchip is how do you get enough sig signal to noise? It is a great idea to make things small. You can save material, you can make the detection faster. However, are you sure you have enough signal? Okay, so this is why uh, the surface modification became very important. Here, for example, let me show you the y-axis is for fluorescent signal. Uh, this control is if you just use a polymer chip, like the 96 wire frame, and put your protein on the surface and do the detection. And can you see how big the signal is? Very small. But if you use a large amount of sample, it's okay, because uh, there's a lot of samples, so signal is still large now. What happens if you reduce the size to only 1%? your signal becomes so small, the noise is too large. Therefore, we have to be sure every single protein you put on the antibody on the chip can function. Conventional way, you don't care. Some of them may function, some of them may not. But in the micro scale or nano scale, it's even worse. You have to be sure every single molecule is exactly the what you want. Okay, we all know that for the uh, protein and anti antibody, the conformation is very complicated. Okay, pro, pro, protein has different type of uh, structure, a primary, secondary, uh, tertiary structure. So you don't just put the protein on the surface. Okay, you really have to be sure the binding is a specific. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Okay, and that's the reason when you put the protein on the solid surface, you got a very low signal. So what we try to do is try to modify the surface. So let me just quickly go through. 
First, we use oxygen plasma to activate the surface to create some hydroxyl group. Otherwise, the, the, the polymer surface is very inert. Then we add some amine group, DEI, and finally we add something called protein A. Uh, I'm not going to get into the deep detail. This protein A is this uh, blue uh, oval here. Uh, what it does is that it will grab the FC uh, region of the uh, antibody. Antibody is like a Y shape. Okay, the, the Y, the top two is where the protection should be. The bottom one is the one you should support the grab. If you grab the wrong end, anybody doesn't work. So this protein A is very specific. It will only grab the S of C. And so it will allow the FAB uh, facing the outside. So this will, this will give you the protection. And see what happened. Okay, with this surface modification, now we got a signal more than 100 times larger. And that's how we make the microchip work. Okay, otherwise, they, uh, uh, it doesn't work. Even the idea is good. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is the convention of 96 with the play. This is our CD uh, ELISA, the cal calibration curve. As a matter of fact, we can cover a very large range of concentration. Conventional uh, CD, uh, conventional uh, ELISA chip actually only have uh, uh, about 1,200 uh, picogram per microliter range, uh, give you the linear curve. After that, we can not, not linear. And our chip actually will go uh, double the range. Okay? So there's a advantage if you can design the uh, IO chip with a proper surface modification. Uh, well, this one shows a, uh, the, we have a, a, a company called Biolog and try to commercialize this equipment. This is the analyzer. This is the detector. This is the implementation device. Uh, just finally to show you that the preliminary comparison, uh, this is for the uh, IgG uh, antibody. It's one of the professors at OSU doing the fermentation, the bioreactor. So uh, I think some of you doing the bioreactor, you know, every once in a while you have to take the sample using ELISA <coughs> to detect what is the potential <coughs> kinetics of your bioreactor. In this case, they try to produce an antibody IgG. Uh, in this case, uh, conventional way takes about 700 micro microliter samples. Uh, with this dimension, this is a uh, micro, micro, micro device here. And when they see that we can cut the uh, uh, total uh, sample to about uh, 140 microliter. Uh, the total, the asset time is the conventional way. In this case, IgG is about 11 to 14 hours. And we cut down to 76 minutes. And we believe if we further shrink it down, we can achieve 100 times material saving, and also about 20 minutes of time. Okay, those are doable, but you have to do it right. So this is the first uh, example I have to share with you. Basically, rely on microfabrication, microcater. Okay, so it's a relatively straightforward uh, concept, but you can see that we need to combine uh, different disciplines, engineering disciplines, and also biology uh, disciplines together uh, to make this work. Okay, the second example I'd like to share with you uh, uh, need a nanoscale polymer processing and nanofluids. And this biochip we call, is called cell electroporation. A very, very new uh, concept, uh, mainly used for gene delivery. Okay, many of you in the room are familiar with the gene delivery, also called the gene uh, cell thing. The idea is to use a uh, nucleic acid for the treatment of uh, diseases. A uh, simple concept is shown here. Uh, for certain uh, patients, uh, because of the malfunction of the gene, uh, usually the, the patient, for example, lacks certain type of pro proteins. Okay, that's why the, we need to divert the gene to try to fix it. And the gene shown here usually is a very large molecule. Uh, typically, it's a more than several thousand base pair. If you are familiar with molecular weight, it's like many millions thousand. It's a very large size. We need to deliver such a larger molecule into the cells, patient cells, and also not only into the cell, you need to get it into the nucleus of the cell. Hopefully this gene can integrate with the host gene, even take over. Okay, then the gene will can control the messenger RNA, then allow them to produce the necessary protein. So that's why we use it for gene cell. But it's not easy at all, because those genes are very big, and they have to go to the nucleus, they have to stay there, for a long time, okay, a stable uh, transaction. It's not very uh, easy. So in recent years, 
uh, most of the gene therapy are actually shipped here to the oligonucleotide. And several people got Nobel Prize in this area in the last five years, uh, including the microRNA, uh, including the sRNA, small interference RNA, and also antisense ODN. Those are much smaller than the acid. Let me just, uh, their size is about 20 to 30 base or base cap, instead of several thousand. So if you use the molecular way, this is about five to six thousand thousand instead of many, many million thousand. So you are talking about small molecule, not as small as a conventional drug, but much smaller than the conventional gene. That's a good news. So easy to get into the cell. Second, it doesn't have to get it into the nucleus. It just needs to get it into the cell. Because those oligonucleotides is try to uh, affect the messenger RNA, not the DNA. So what they will do is they will bind onto the specific messenger RNA to destroy it. To destroy this messenger RNA, therefore, it will not produce the protein. So totally opposite to the gene therapy. Gene therapy is to promote. We call it upregulating. This one is downregulating. Okay, try to silence the gene. And the reason is try to make the cell weaker, even kill the cell. So it's mainly for the cancer treatment. We all know for the cancer disease, people have to use a chemotherapy and radi uh, radiation, and quite often it works the first time. Second time, the body, the, the cancer cells smart enough, they know how to fight. Right? They're getting stronger. What do you do? You have to use high do dosage, you have to more toxic chemotherapy. That's why the cancer patients are very, very sick, because what are you going to do? You know, the chemotherapy is going to kill you almost say, 50% of your life. Right? Otherwise, you're going to die. So therefore, that's current uh, cancer uh, treatment. And what do those oligonucleotides can do for you is to help. Because they can down silence in the gene, the cancer gene, and to uh, down regulate the protein to make the cell weaker. Therefore, you can combine with the conventional chemotherapy or the small molecule drug to get the drug down. If you use enough, you can kill the cancer cell. So that's why the oligonucleotides. OK, but I'm going to. I'll give you an example of how to deliver uh, those two, but this is the area called uh, gene uh, therapy. Uh, there are different ways to deliver the gene, okay, including the physical uh, methods, uh, so-called the gene gun. This is the gene gun here. What it does is to uh, uh, attach the, the gene onto the micro-sized low particle. They simply just use a gun, pneumatic gun, to shoot it into it. Uh, this this uh, low particle can penetrate the skin and get into the cell. Of course, it's not very well controlled. Okay, just shoot it there. That's called gene lung. One can use a micro-injection. You know the micro-injection, right? You took the cell into the microscope using the pipette and very care carefully penetrate the pipette into the cell and put the drug into the cell. But usually, it's for very large cells and using the one cell. You need a special skilled person. At Ohio State University, only the one uh, doctor knows how to do it. Everybody has to send sample to her, and she charges like four thousand dollars per month, uh, per month. You know, and we just uh, ask her to do the three three months, uh, twelve thousand dollars. But she's the only one who can do it in Ohio State University. So that's micro injection. The third way is called electroporation. That's the one I want to show with you. Okay. Uh, other way is using a so-called nano carrier. Uh, virus is most well known one. Right, virus, you, you, you take the virus gene out, put the surface gene, and let the virus do the job. Virus knows how to get into the cells, better than us, except that it's not very safe. Okay, so there are a lot of people trying to come out with synthetic nanoparticles. Uh, I'm not going to get into that today, uh, the way I do the most. But I'm going to talk about electroporation today. Uh, first, let me briefly explain what is electroporation. Very simple concept. Uh, we all know the cell uh, has a uh, lipid by layer. Uh, they are bound together by the electrostatic charge. Okay, so this is the uh, membrane. Of course, with the pro protein, sugars, and other stuff on the surface, biomarkers. But what happens is that if you give an external electric pulse, you can upset the cell membrane. And therefore, you can form a lot of the holes, those tiny nano holes. And one can use a cryo SEM actually to see those holes before electroration and after electroration. And these little holes will allow the drug to diffuse in. That's called electroporation. Okay, so what you do is you put the cells, you put the DNA drugs in a little reservoir, you just put an electrode, boom, give a shot. Okay? And this is a shot, and that's it. 
And then there will be whole form of the same surface and drop it in. It's very simple, uh, easy to use. However, it's not very well controlled because you have a cell suspended in there. They interfere with each other. The entire surface will be shot. You may kill the cells. If the hole is too large, cell die. If the hole is too small, the, the diffusion is not good. So therefore, for every single type of cell, you have to design the best condition. Uh, so it's not very user friendly. Also, uh, cell liability is not very good, and transfection is limited uh, by this method. But it's very simple. And the growth rate is very, very high, because this is one of the very few methods works for stem cells, and also the IPS uh, cells. We don't know that in the future, we use a cell-based therapy, we need to engineer cells, deliver the gene. And the uh, virus is not the, virus is most efficient, but it's not very safe. So people think about the generation. But however, current method is not very well controlled. So therefore, in our lab, which, oh, by the way, then let me show you why it is not. This is, we put a single cell. There you can see that we, we, we put a dye called PI dye. And this dye, when they're diffused into the cell, it will interact with the nuclear acid, and you can see the fluorescence. So this is a cell. This is the electric field. You can see they will diffuse from every direction, particularly from this end and this end. See it again. Uh, you can see uh, diffusion from here, here, then everywhere. Now this is because if you do the calculation, this is cell, this is the electric field. The entire cell surface will be affected. And this one here shows the so-called transmembrane potential, V sub n. Transmembrane potential essentially is the pressure experienced by the cell surface. The certain force try to tear the surface apart to create a hole. Okay? Higher the uh, Vn, higher the force. Uh, this is from the theta, so the entire cell surface, 0 to 2 pi. You can see the very high this end, very high this end, which is this end, this end. However, the entire cell surface will be affected by the property alteration. So what we've been trying to do is to change this uh, situation by using so-called uh, membrane sandwich alteration. Uh, let me walk us through uh, uh, this diagram here. So instead of uh, having many cells suspended in a cuvette, we try to make a sandwich. What we do is we bring the cell onto a polymer membrane, the yellow one, with the holes at the bottom, cell lay on the top. Then we put another polymer membrane on top. That's why we call the membrane sandwich. Okay? Cells in between. Then we put our DNA or gene on top of the sandwich and give the electric field. As we know that the gene carry the negative charge in the buffer solution, so they will migrate toward the positive electron. The only place they can go is through the, the pores on the mem membrane, in particular this kind of novel membrane. Therefore, those pores provide highly focused and localized electric field. Instead of uh, damaging the cell everywhere, you try to focus in a local area. Also, you can confine and stretch the DNA. The DNA going through the nozzle, they can be stretched. Okay, let me show you the next one here. This is a large DNA. They're usually forming a coil, but when they go through the micro channel or nano channel, they will be stretched by like rubber band. Okay, you can see that from here to here. This is a uh, molecular dynamic simulation. And therefore, when they're forming a coil, uh, it's a pretty larger size. But when you stretch the DNA, we all know that the diameter is only two nanometers. So you can shoot, <laughs> shoot the DNA into the cell membrane instead of a big chunk of the, the DNA try to squeeze in. Okay, so this is the advantage of using a, uh, uh, this type of design. Uh, you can also see the uh, transmembrane potential, okay, V sub n. I already show you that the, uh, for the bulk bulk iteration, uh, it is basically the, the, the dash line, but the red one is based on the membrane sandwich because we have the electric field going through this little hole. So therefore, only the very small surface of the cell experience high uh, volume. Remaining surface is very benign. Okay, so that's an advantage. You can also see that we don't need a very high electric field. In order to reach the same maxima, we sub n, 80 volt per centimeter, instead of 500 volts per centimeter. So that's why it's very benign compared to the conventional method. 
Uh, so the question is, how do you make this a, a nano uh, nozzle uh, membrane? Uh, a lot of the technology uh, we are using is called sacrificial temporary printing. I mean, you can use it at EDM lithography, it looks like very uh, expensive. Uh, this is very cheap. So let me walk you through. First, what you need is the optical fiber bundle, shown here. This is the optical fiber bundle used for optical communication. You can buy about one foot, $30, and you just need a small piece. And what you do, uh, in this case, it's about 300 micron diameter. It contain 10,000 individual optical fiber, which is a, this is a blue color here. And each fiber is surrounded by plating material. Uh, the green color is a blue color here, okay? So what you do is you, you dip this uh, your little piece into an aging solution. You can control the chemi uh, chemistry. What it does is that this solution will dissolve the optical fiber, the green one and the blue one, but at different rate. So in this case, we will let the solution dissolve the blue material faster. Green material that you can control. You can go the other way. Okay? So what happened is after a short while, you got this kind of nano tip already. It's like a sharpened the pen pencil. Okay? Except this is a nano pencil and many, many small pencil. And it looks like this. Okay? The next step is to make a PDMS mold. So this is a nano mold. So what we do is we put a PDMS you're probably more familiar with, a soft, soft lithography. We put the resin on top of this. So we could go from the, this structure to the female structure shown here. But it is a PDMS rubber. The next step is the sacrificial temper. Then we can cast a uh, water soluble part, the blue material, onto the PDMS. After it dry, we take it out. So one of this nanotip array can make many, many of PDMS mold. Every PDMS mold can make many, many of sacrificial temper. And here shows the sacrificial temper. Then finally, what you do is you put the polymer you want on the sacrificial temper, like this yellow material, spin coat. Uh, they're actually going to form this kind of nozzle structure. This is because the contact angle. The yellow solution tries to hang out into the nozzle. So you can use a polymer solution. After you dry the solvent, you got the membrane. Or you can use a resin, uni-cure, thermocure, you got the membrane. The final step is to put this in the water. The blue material will dissolve. It's water soil. The yellow material stays, and you got your nano nozzle. Some of you might say, why don't you just use this nano tip and try to push down to the polymer to make the uh, nano, nano holes? And we actually did. It didn't work. Because those tip is very, very fragile. We are talking about nano tip. The surface area is so large. If you try to push down, pull it out, you look at it, half of your tip is gone. <laughs> okay, so therefore we have to use a sacrificial approach. It's very much like a semiconductor approach, except we try to use volume. Okay, addition, subtraction. That's <coughs> it, right? So you cannot just force it. Anyway, so this method works. And here I'll show you that. So this is our nano nozzle array, a membrane sandwich we put in the middle of this micro chip, and those reservoirs where you put your cell and DNA, and then you put in this device, and this is the power supply for, for the electroporation. And here I'm going to show you a movie uh, that they, uh, you can see those are DNA shoots through this nozzle, shooting through using fluorescent line. So therefore, you put a cell under, underneath, and you can shoot them through. And we use a, a, a PGLP, uh, you're familiar with it now. This is a reported gene, uh, which means if it's successfully transfected, it will produce a protein. Uh, this pro protein will emit a green fluorescence. That's called GLP, green fluorescence protein. And this gene is called PGLP. And therefore, more the green, better the results. And uh, this is our results on, the, on this side. And this is a convention method. So one can see it works much better, okay? Uh, so, so this is a one uh, technology you can combine the micro-scale fabrication and the fruit it together. However, still limitation, which means we still put many, many cells there. We just shoot the, the DNA into it. We don't know how much DNA it will in the cell. Therefore, it's still a stochastic approach. And so the medical doctor always should ask us, can you guys do the uh, dose control? giving individual cells a shot 
I want it this much, I want this much, I want this much. So the non-stochastic approach. The reason is because for the gene therapy and for the oligonucleotide, people really want to understand the cell biology. How do the drugs affect the cell biology inside the individual cell? Current technology is many, many cells, and you just rely on the uh, average. Okay, that's one reason. Second reason is because for the real cells. Some of the cases, you don't have many cells. For example, if you look at this picture of the photo on the right hand side, uh, this is a, uh, my uh, colleague, a, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeff Chalmers. Uh, he used a magnetic uh, separation method to took the cancer cells from a breast cancer patient or OHU hospital. Those are all the cancer cells, breast cancer cells. But using different biomarker, they found the two cells in the yellow envelope different from the red one. And they believe, they believe, okay? Those two are the stem cells, the cancer stem cells. Cancer stem cell is the most dangerous one. You can kill the other cells, but if those stem cells stay, the cancer is still there. Okay, but so we have to figure out what's the difference between the cancer stem cell versus the cancer cell or cancer cell versus the healthy cell. And when you put the drug in there, how much you need to kill the stem cell, how much you need to kill the cancer cell, hopefully you can kill the other cells, okay? Uh, but those are the very rare cells. Uh, I was told for the solid tumor, out, out of the one million cancer cells, there may be four to five stem cells. So therefore, how do you get those guys? Uh, how do you find out what is the DNA, messenger RNA protein in those cells? Uh, how do you deliver the drug to those individual cells and see what's the difference between these cells and other cells? And what we need is a dose control gene delivery to individual cells. So this is the final uh, part of my uh, talk today I want to share with you. Uh, it's an ongoing uh, research project in our lab. Uh, here I just show you this slide uh, for a microRNA detection in the cell. Uh, because of the time limit, I'm not going to go through the detail. I uh, just want to show uh, you that the current technology is on the QRT-PCR, microarray, uh, north and rough. Uh, all this methods me require many, many cells, half a million, one to two million, 10 million cells. Otherwise, you cannot do it. And you need a long time, one to two days, even two to four days. And you need to label the cell, uh, the, the uh, microRNA. So therefore, you have to do a lot of things to the samples. Otherwise, you cannot do the detection. So therefore, it's not the best idea, but this is the current state of art. Now, what is the ideal method? Hopefully, we can use a raw cell. That means that uh, don't do anything. Okay, just break the cell, and okay, you can detect it. Beautiful. So how to do that, we don't know. And uh, the other one is to do the cell in situ. Can we actually detect what's in the cell without breaking the cell? That would be even better. I know Dr. Shima is just sitting there. We, are, we try to do something new. <laughs> okay, the second one is that can we do the single cell? You know, I mean, you can only find four to five. You, know, you cannot find one million uh, stem cells. How do you do it? Okay, can we do it in real time, like 20 minutes? One hour instead of two days. Right? Of course, uh, the use of primary, all that good stuff. Okay, I have to say we don't have any methods yet, yeah. but this is the uh, one everybody tried to do. I think for people in the room, we combine the micro technology, nanotechnology, biotechnology. One of these days we can do it. Okay, so here, uh, of course, Professor Ashiba has many good ideas. I'm going to show you a one of the methods uh, we are trying try to do is to create this kind of, uh, we say, hidden cells as shot. Okay, so we try to come out with a micro channel, a pair of micro channel. Then we try to put a nano channel uh, in between. That's, that's what we want. Okay, then make this kind of array. And what we do is we want to put a cell on one side, put the DNA or drug on the other side. Then we're going to give the electric field and try to shoot the DNA into the cell individually and fix them up, giving cells a shot. How do you do it? And this one we call nano-channel iterational MEP. Okay, so let me tell you how, how we design this kind of structure. Uh, so uh, the method we use is called a molecular coning. Another technology which has been around for more than 10 years. Very, very simple, I think. If you have a DNA solution or polymer solution, what you do is you put a solid piece like a glass plate or silicon wafer. You just dip into the solution like here. And just quickly pull it out. Some of you probably did, right? Okay, then you're going to watch it. You're going to see on the solid surface, DNA stretch into the nanowires. 
and showing on this green, green line here. The reason is because the DNA will bind onto the solid surface. When you quickly pull out from the solution, neither this uh, liquid, solid, and the air interface. There's very, very high stretching force, very, very high, okay, because such a nano scale. And that stretching force will stretch the DNA into the water. That's what you see there. The only problem is it's random. But what we did is actually try to improve molecular quality. What we did is that on the surface, we tried to create this micro pattern. This is what our work. You see those gray pillars? So we have gray pillars. Then we do the molecular field. And all the DNA now align on the top of the pillar. But uh, this is the DNA. Okay, so that's the only difference. Okay? Uh, why this thing works? I will use this slide to quickly walk through. Uh, this is what happened during the molecular uh, 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 combing uh, with the pattern. Uh, this is side view. Uh, it goes left to right. And this is top view. So it goes from, uh, this is a water solution to DNA. So let me just, let's just follow the top view. Uh, follow this one. So when the, when the solution uh, re retreat, because the surface is hydrophobic, retreat to this point, this area is hydrophilic because of water. This area is hydrophobic. What happens is these two kind of lines will, will retreat faster. So go like this. What happens is it will run out the DNA in the middle all to this location. Okay, then when the, when the liquid from jump from this one to this one, they stretch the DNA. You know, like a soft jump. Very, very high stretching force. And they were lying the DNA. That's what happened. Okay, very simple uh, concept. And uh, we use the molecular simulator dynamic. You can see that the DNA uh, uh, lines up. Uh, then we go time linear, then we could go through. Uh, that's the first step. You create this DNA rock. Now we have to create the nano channel. So what we do is the second step is we combine the combing with the imprinting. That's why we call this the DNA combing and the imprinting PCI. Let me walk you through. This is a uh, micro uh, the pillar. This is DNA. And what you do is you turn this thing upside down. You okay, put it on the glass plate. Then you put a liquid uh, resin. The resin will diffuse into the space, like this one. You use the UV light to cure the resin. Then you pull the stem out. What happens is you will break the DNA. Then the pillar will become the hole. Right, this is the pillar, this is the hole, and this is the broken DNA. Some of the DNA trapped inside, like this. And if you look at the side view, you see this DNA between the two holes. And we can etch out the DNA. Now you've got a nano channel. So you got a nano channel between the two microwaves. So you start from the DNA nano wire, give you the nano channel. You start from the micro pillar, they give you the microwave. You know, just go uh, the other way. Okay, so this is called PCI. Uh, you can see that we can generate a large surface area at uh, very, very low cost. And you can see those holes. And this is a, uh, a for, for rest type of shoot. So therefore, one can make a several inch size at uh, very, very low cost. You don't need any printing stuff. Uh, for, the, for the nano iteration, uh, what we are doing is using uh, a little bit different design, but same concept. Uh, I have several slides to finish my talk. Uh, we use this kind of a micro reach, okay? So you have two micro reach, and you do the uh, uh, PCI, uh, you form the DNA wire, and then we go to the printing, pull it out, and then we will etch out the DNA. For the DNA. Okay? Uh, this one show, show, shows you the DNA wire between two uh, micro uh, reach, and this is another design. And this is a, after you, uh, the micro reach became the micro channel, the nano wire became the nano channel uh, in between. Okay, so that's, that's what we do. And then what we did next is we put a cover, cover this area, and okay, then we put the cells on this side, put the DNA on the other side, and using electric field to shoot them in. Okay, uh, this one shows that we use the optical tweezers to move. This is one uh, cells. We try to move to the uh, end of this area uh, here, to end of the nano. Uh, the micro channel before we shoot the DNA. Okay, uh, this one shows that, that we can using a different vo voltage to control amount of DNA we can shoot through. Uh, in this case, we use 500 millisecond pulse. 20 volt, 40, 60, 80. And this one is the ODN, the small DNA. 
This one is a GLP, uh, the big one. But uh, I basically want to say that we can control amount of material shoot to the other side by using a voltage, or you can use the same voltage. You can control the pulse length. Instead of 500 millisecond, you can do it 10 millisecond, 1 millisecond. Or you can do the many pulses. So those are the parameters we can control. Okay, next one I'm going to show you is a movie that we put a cells on this uh, channel, uh, channel, put a uh, PI die over on the right hand side, and we're going to shoot the PI die into the cell. Remember I told you the PI die into the cell will react with nuclear acid, and you're going to see the fluorescence line. Okay, so watch this movie here. Yeah, you cannot see the cell without PI die into the cell, only when the shoot in. You see that? Okay, boom, you shoot in. And now they have a few seconds, uh, the whole cell becomes dry. Okay, so that's why the dose control. In comparison, this is the movie I showed you earlier, the bulk evaporation. One can see that the, the PI guy gradually diffusing from everywhere, and you have no control. They just keep diffusing in. But in this case, we can control. I guess I better finish very soon. So this is uh, before the evaporation, this is after the evaporation. Uh, this one to show you that again, using the bulk illustration takes a long time, 18 seconds, because it's a diffusion control. In our case, 0 0.03 second, 0 0.1 second, because our is an injection, it's a, uh, uh, it's a convection control, not a, not, not a convection control. Uh, let me quickly go through. Uh, again, uh, this one shows the bulk illustration. Because the, the PI guy diffused in, so it's getting higher and higher. In our case, in the beginning, it's very high in the needle. Then the needle actually is diffused. Uh, going down, the edge goes up because you shoot a fixed amount of uh, PI guy. They're only diffused in the cell. Uh, here, I also want to point out, uh, if you try to use the micro hole, the result is not good. It has to be met. We actually did the uh, MEP, the micro hole evaporation. And it actually follow the bulk illustration. The reason is because the micro hole is too large. Okay, I'll just show you one slide here. This is actually done by UP School at the UC Berkeley uh, five years ago. Uh, they use the micro channels to sales there to shoot the uh, micro pore illustration. Uh, but the micro pore is too large, almost the same size as the cell. So therefore, you cannot keep cell in shot. Okay, so still like the bulk illustration, except it's better. And if you go back to this slide, you can see that the, it's still diffusion control, but it is faster. Uh, but the, however, the nano pole can change the whole mechanism from the diffusion control. Okay, so finally, let me just uh, show you uh, uh, two results. Uh, first is we show the small DNA. This is the uh, ODN. We use like a uh, one pulse, 25 milliseconds, 50 millisecond, uh, 10 millisecond, five times. And this is a patient cell, a leukemia patient cell, very small cell. This cell is only eight micron, very, very tiny. Uh, this one here, we use a uh, uh, five millisecond, 10 millisecond, 20 millisecond, 40, and 60. And you can see that you can get those control by control the, the length of the pulse. And this one here shows the, the sRNA. Again, this sRNA can downregulate a very important uh, uh, pro protein in many cancer cells for MCL1. If you downregulate MCL1 a lot, the cancer cell will die. So I'll just quickly show you this one here from bottom up. If we do it in one millisecond, the cell is very healthy. The, the, green, the, the green means the cell is healthy. The red means the cell is dead. Okay? Two milliseconds, well, you start to see the cell is not very healthy, still alive. Okay, 10 milliseconds, dead. Uh, so therefore, we can control the dose to find out the threshold. But by the way, in order to demonstrate this is a cell death, it's not because our electric force kills the cell. We're also using a scramble SRNA, which means we design another SRNA with, with the wrong sequence. And now you can see that the cell is alive. So therefore, the cell death is caused by the drug, not by the, our electric force. Okay? Finally, I want to show you the big deal. The GFP uh, is much bigger, 3.5 thousand uh, base pair. Uh, this one is very big, 
So I must say that we cannot shoot them right into the entire cells because they are so big. Uh, after 30 seconds, they are still in this cell. We shoot from left to right. Uh, 40 seconds, two minutes, five minutes. So they are in the cell, but still near the edge because the viscosity is very high in the cell. So they were so diffused. But I want to point out that it's much better than bulk illustration. This is the bulk illustration. You can see the, the GFP after 10 minutes. They are still outside the door. At least in our case, our DNA is already there. Okay, and this is other people's work. Uh, after 24 hours, those big DNA still try to get in. And as our method still doing a better job. Right now, we try to find out a better way. Try to remember those big DNA have to get into the nucleus. Okay, so the job is not full done yet. For the small one, we can do it pretty good. For the big one, we still have to do it more. Uh, well, but uh, even for the big one, it still works. You can see after 24 hours, uh, there's a good progress. It works. Okay. Uh, this is the final slide. Uh, I just show you one one cell, or we can do many cells. Okay, this is two two cells. Uh, this is the uh, sRNA. This is the GFP. Okay, I guess I better stop. I uh, just want to acknowledge the uh, postdoc and students. Uh, as you all know, that the uh, student postdoc did all the work the professor got a chance to present. That's always the case. Uh, some of them as a graduate from OSU. I also want to uh, acknowledge the, the, my, my colleagues. Uh, from different department, including several uh, MDs who work with them. So with that, I'd like to stop and then uh, you to send you the So what we're doing now is to mix the uh, nanoparticle and the DNA together and let the nanoparticle to create the hole, the DNA follow. Uh, but I don't have time to talk about that. But so typically we try to make one layer mm -hmm. in order to make the best results. I must ask you about the method that they use to separate cancer stem cells from cancer cells. Oh, separation? Yeah. Separation is not my expertise. Uh, that one is not my expertise. Yeah, yeah, they use a, a basic a concept is pretty straightforward. They use a neck particle and put the uh, biomarkers and the antibody on the particle surface. Then when you have many, many cells on the blood samples, and you can put them together. The, the antibody will recognize the biomarker on the cancer cell. Then using the magnetic device to separate. They go the, the cancer cell or the non-cancer cell with magnetic particle. Yeah, so they, they use the surface marker. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you have to find out the right service model to do this operation. Uh, since you can make a nano channel, uh, nano channel. Uh, can you make a uh, nano channel to yeah, penetrate it to the nucleus? Or inside of the inside yeah. of the uh, <laughs> just like in the novel books. <laughs> I saw a lot of people show this nano machine going into the body. So. No, I don't know, but she, maybe you can do it. <laughs> 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 Professor Rajiv, uh, I, I have to say, uh, in my opinion, well, I guess one of these days probably can, but uh, to be honest, that's my opinion. Uh, most of the devices we are making, in particular biochip, is still micro scale. I mean, you can see those biochips, but with the micro function and nano function. That's my opinion. Um, to make a nano one, we, we are doing that, but those are the nanoparticle uh, illegal delivery. Uh, but they are not that powerful. We have not been able to put all the function on this little device and get it inside. I don't know if somebody in the room knows how to do it, but not me. <laughs> yeah, those, those are in the future. Yeah. Excuse me? Uh, may I 
may I know the transaction efficiency and the uh, sale viability for which one? After using uh, both, 3D okay. and uh, narrow. Yeah, the narrow observation is 100%. Uh -huh. Don't, don't worry, because we actually try to kill the sale we cannot. <laughs> because all the electric field just goes through that narrow hole. We, we go very, very high electric field until the temperature getting too high because the jaw heating. Uh, no, we cannot kill the cell because the electric field only goes through the narrow hole. But uh, the, however, there's a limitation. For example, if you say, can you do half million cells? Uh, Maybe that's much like we work together. Right now, I mean, we are doing like one, two, three, four. I mean, we are so we have a server master. We try to do the different array, magnetic tweezer array, optical uh, tweezer. Try to get to several hundred, but not a half million. So our method is limitation. The membrane sandwich one is not a hundred percent, but much better compared to the ball. But it's not a per perfect control. So. Yeah, so I'm not saying all mess is going to replace all the mess. We have signed up management, not a, not a, you know, we have signed the too. Thanks. Okay, um, just fascinating talk. Um, so for, I'm interested in the single cell optimization. So do you envision this um, developing into maybe single cell ELISA type of assay where you can capture single cell and then get the slice out through the core and that an actual professor or should be <laughs> <laughs> are, are you going to present our work? Uh, are uh, yeah, you going to present our work? Yes. Uh, we, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> no, we, we are doing that too. The way to do is, a, uh, I think I'm trying to get in is to inject the molecular beacon. Because the molecular beacon can do the in, in situ. Uh, but that technology compared to PCR, Western bra or Northern bra. I don't think the medical field accepts the technology yet. I don't know if you have any comment, the molecular vision. Yeah. I think that's a good idea, except that it, uh, I'm very excited about that. Uh, it's a molecular beacon, you know, you can shoot in there, you can do in situ detection. Inside itself. Inside itself, uh, except that the... But is there a technology available to get the lysate out from a single cell? That's what I thought you were saying. I'm going to save that for you <laughs> next week. Okay. Huh? All right, so yeah. because lack of time, I guess, last question. Yes. Okay. About the city lifestyle, do you have any solution for uh, to the heat module on the internal CD? Uh, what were you missing? Heating, heating function. Oh, heating function. Yeah. Oh, you mean to do the PCR? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, control the different yeah. location direction oh. to move the, the solution to. Well, uh, my, yeah, I think people are doing that. I mean, uh, there are a lot of people who uh, put the heating element. My view is to make that, it, uh, it's my view, is that analyzer can be expensive. You don't show up, right? Uh, but the CD, it's my view, I want to make it as cheap as possible. Because you have to show up, right? So you put a heating element on that, you have to consider the cost. I mean, the principle, yes, yeah, you can put it on the function. There's a question of that. Uh, I mean, you know, we have to make it very, very low cost. So my philosophy is to make it simple. <laughs> uh, but to answer your question, yes, and you can put the local heating element. It has been done by many, many other researchers. Okay, thank you.